Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Hopefully I'm sharing my screen, is that right? Am yes, all good. And we're sharing the slides. Sharing this, uh, so we can see the slides and we can see the slides coming on the next bit. Okay, um, so um, we haven't got that much in the way of slides, but just to sort of just have some visual structure. Um, so anyway, the pleasure's all ours. Thank you so much for inviting us to celebrate World Autism Awareness Week um, with this webinar um, with you. Um, so we're really pleased to have this opportunity to talk about how our understanding of autism has changed in recent years um, and how certain perceptions of autism have changed or are changing or need to change. So fundamentally, many of these changes stem from the fact that our understanding of autism um, has widened from a narrow medicalized disorder type of model to a far broader understanding of the spectrum um, and how some features of autism can both be assets and or challenges depending on the context. So today we're going to talk about some of those perceptions or myths that are now being challenged by better understanding. Um, and the first one I'm going to start with is that um, myth number one, hang on, let me, so I'm not going to be brilliant at um, managing the slides at the same time. <laughs> Hang on, I've now lost the slides. Uh, can I just keep talking anyway? So the myth number one is that people with autism aren't sociable. And that's all that is on the slide, on the first slide. So we can always share slides later. I'm so sorry, I don't seem to be able to find them. And um, so, um, in fact, many people with autism have got strong social connections, um, often with like-minded individuals or through common interests, much like non-autistic people. Um, in fact, it might be true to say that um, people with autism do experience difficulties, of course, socially, and many are more isolated than they would like. Um, and some autistic people do prefer um, do you report rather genuinely preferring to avoid social situations, um, maybe because they find socialising confusing or uninteresting or exhausting at times. Um, but the recent lockdowns gave us an opportunity to think about the impact of some of the enforced social restrictions on autistic people as well as, um, well, everybody really. Um, and several studies looked at this and found quite mixed findings. Um, so, for example, some research by Liz Pelicano and colleagues exam um, um, indicated that autistic people were just as impacted by the lack of socialization as were people without autism. So they talked about the impact on their mental health, um, missing not only existing social connections, but also incidental social opportunities also. Um, so to be fair, the research is quite mixed. Um, and in fact, the impact of lockdown on people was mixed as well. So in some ways, the reduced social um, opportunities also reduced um, social pressure and reduced anxiety levels. Um, but equally, many people with autism felt that the lack of social contact, felt that lack of social contact just as keenly as non-autistic people. Um, I also came across an interesting article today about the connectedness that autistic people can feel with each other. Um, and um, I, I often work with young people who have friends who also have neurodiverse traits. And I think like any of us, people tend to gravitate towards people, other people who get us. Um, so in short, autistic people do seek social relationships, but there may be a number of factors that make socialising challenging. Um, so being around people who understand or in environments where differences are understood and supported can really, really help with this. So helping people to develop their social skills through formal social skills teaching might be one strategy or making sure that teaching staff or work colleagues are aware of differences is another strategy. Um, so, for example, knowing that if somebody's communication style seems to upset people, that most likely it's not intended to be rude or confrontational, but maybe stems from a tendency towards a more direct style of communication, for example. And it's also important to recognise that socialing, socialising um, with all the demands, for example, processing language, understanding other people's intentions, reading the room, can be really exhausting and that a quiet place or downtime might be needed at home, at school or in the workplace. So that's my first myth. So over to Mariana for myth two, and I'll try and work out where the slides have gone. Oh, just need to unmute at Mariana. Thank you, that would help. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, for uh, this introduction. 
And myth number two uh, is one that actually for a long time, it was assumed that people with autism find it difficult to understand what other people are thinking or feeling. And it was assumed that this made it more difficult for neurodivergent people to fit in, make friends, or indeed express empathy. Well, let us start dispelling this myth by a quote from uh, Donna Williams, who is a multi-talented Australian writer and artist who wrote several books about her experiences of being autistic. Donna said, right from the start, from the time someone came up with the word autism, the condition has been judged from the outside by its appearances and not from the inside, according to how it's experienced. As such, what is observed on the outside tends to be interpreted by a kind of neurotypical lens. And as we are increasingly able to learn from the perspectives of neurodiverse communities, there is an increased understanding that different communication styles can result in communication mismatch. More recently, studies have shown that the problem is actually bi-directional and that people who do not have autism find it just as difficult to understand what people with autism are thinking or feeling. So this is often referred to as double empathy problem, which is a term coined by Dr. Damien Milton, who is an autism activist, lecturer and sociologist. The concept of double empathy implies that differences in communication styles and social expectations can lead to communication breakdowns, which can be a source of distress for both people with autism as well as people without autism. However, rather than it being a problem only on the side of neurodivergent people, it clearly is a problem which goes both ways. Hopefully having this understanding will encourage us to have more open dialogues about different ways in which we communicate and hopefully increase mutual respect and understanding. Myth number three, Anne, and we lost our slides. Yes, I'm afraid to say I just can't quite find them, but myth number three, and my dog's now having a little moment, but anyway, is that people with autism have no imagination, autistic people have no imagination. So this one, I think, has probably been busted for quite a while now. Um, so I think it's well recognised now that many autistic people have got fantastic creative abilities. Um, I've certainly worked with clients who have written beautiful poetry um, or who produce artwork, which is not only creative, but incredibly expressive. Um, in fact, it may be that many autistic people find it easier to express themselves emotionally through imagination and creativity rather than via direct communication sometimes. I think it's true to say that the play of autistic children or um, can be more repetitive and maybe less imaginative than their typically developing peers sometimes, but this isn't true for everybody. Um, and also a preference towards repetitive or mechanistic play doesn't necessarily preclude the development of wonderful imaginative skills. Um, so sometimes harnessing or fostering creative skills um, needs an understanding of autistic differences. So for example, somebody might be a talented artist, but they might find it difficult to conform to the expectations of art GCSE, for example. Um, so helping people discover their talents or facilitating creative skills to flourish um, can be a really important um, 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 aspect, I suppose, of identity development and also developing people's self-esteem as well. And a related myth, which I would like to bust um, as a practicing clinical psychologist, is that metaphor should be avoided when delivering therapy for autistic people. I think uh, metaphor can be a really powerful way of illustrating a point or helping people to look at something differently. Um, I think the assumption might be that autistic people won't have the imaginative skills or flexibility to think in the abstract, but I've certainly experienced many autistic clients who not only understood metaphor, but also brought their own very creative and relevant metaphors to therapy, which we were able to run with and use. So I'm over to you, Mariana, for myth number four. Thank you, Anne. So myth number four, people with autism have difficulties with communication. This myth is very deeply ingrained in people's minds uh, to the point that uh, it's included uh, in majority of textbooks or professional presentations about autism. Some of that likely stems from our historical view of autism or in fact any kind of diversity where any kind of diversity was viewed as pathology. But we could also question to which extent this myth is really perpetuated by the lack of reflection of neurotypical people. 
if we define people with autism as having difficulties with communication, we are kind of implicitly implying that neurotypical people have a better or superior communication. But is that really the case? People with neurodiversity often prefer communication which is clear, precise, correct, honest, direct, to the point, uh, communication which is about topics that um, clearly matter rather than small talk. I mean, I personally know a lot of people who complain about small talks, but we still feel that it has to be done. Um, so neurotypical communication style can on the contrary be much more kind of multi-channel and actually confusing. For instance, um, where our communicative partner says, that's interesting. What I actually mean or usually mean is, okay, that's enough about this. Or often we may say to a child with autism, that's funny when they make a joke, which we actually feel um, may not be quite well integrated in a context. And then we say that the child has difficulties with understanding appropriate social context when they repeat the same joke again. Having been fortunate to be surrounded by a neurodivergent community, I have endless anecdotes. Um, about how excellent, uh, in speech marks obviously, uh, communication skills of neurotypical people are. Um, to mention just one, a wonderful colleague and a friend of mine um, who has autism very kindly offered to help me uh, with my website. And uh, helpfully, he asked me what I would like it to look. And I was trying to be my most grateful, appreciative, kind, uh, accommodating self. So I said, absolutely anything. I would like anything at all. And um, of course, uh, next day he sent me a link for me to check out what he designed. I opened the link and the website is literally one color, which I do not like. Okay, so I apologized to him and I said, I'm really sorry. This is literally one color I do not like. There he is, he doesn't mention to me, Mariana, I asked you. He politely asked me which color he can change it to. So next day he changes it to my color that I, I like. Um, and have I learned from my previous mistake? Absolutely not. So when I open a link, uh, it is the color I like, but it's a really hard geometric kind of uh, masculine shapes. So there I am having to apologize yet again for not actually saying uh, what I wanted. I will spare you from continuation of this story, but I can assure you that certainly um, I actually, had I only listened to the question that he asked me and answered it clearly, we could have prevented a lot, a lot of problems. Um, so have I adapted my communication style? Clearly not. So if we as neurotypical people want to claim that people with autism have difficulties with adapting their communication style, we ought to question ourselves whether actually neurotypical uh, people are adapting their communication style to suit neurodivergent community. And if people truly reflect on their communication styles, um, neurotypical people who claim to have less difficulties with communication and less difficulties with flexibility seem to have just as much difficulty adapting their communication style that neurodivergent members of our community. As such, are there differences in communication styles? Yes, there are. But equally, there are times where different communication styles are preferable. For example, if someone was operating on my eye, uh, I would much rather prefer them to have direct, clear uh, communication style than hinting on something or saying something they do not mean just to be kind, again in speech marks. As a result, our take home message ought to be to learn to recognize and appreciate strengths as well as weaknesses of diverse communication styles depending on the context and situation. The main message uh, we would therefore hope to raise is one of open communication to increase mutual understanding and appreciation. To you for next week. Okay, so myth number five was that autistic people are bound to be actions part of autism. So again, this one's been bust, busted for quite a while now. Um, recently, there's been quite a bit of attention given to the fact that autism is still classified as a, a mental disorder and uh, we're of the view that the very use of the word disorder does imply that there's something wrong with having autism. So while we're not advocating a view that autism does not confer challenges, we feel that thinking of autism as a disorder overly pathologizes people. So we much prefer to think of it in terms of neurodiversity. However, we do recognize that one of the most common associated challenges with autism, um, that, which is that of emotional um, difficulties, 
sometimes was very overlooked until relatively recently. Um, so, um, so the high levels of anxiety that many people with autism experience, um, or rather the fact that anxiety is a separate treatable condition um, has often been neglected. So it can still be very hard for autistic people to access the right support with mental health difficulties, um, including anxiety, um, particularly at the moment. Um, but at least now our understanding of how anxiety presents and how treatment might need to be adapted is a little bit more sophisticated. So in terms of how to manage anxiety, well, um, quite a lot has been um, written about adaptations to therapy um, and medication has a role to play as well, of course. Um, but we believe that the best anxiety management strategy is um, environmental adaptations. Um, so, for example, having advanced planning, preparation, having space, space to go to at times of overload, visual supports, to name a few, those sorts of things might happen in schools. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, adaptations in a bit as well. So, um, over to Mariana for myth number six. Oh, no, it's me. Sorry, myth number six. Myth number six is that um, all, autistic, all autistic people have a special skill. Um, so some people with autism do have phenomenal skills, um, like being able to calculate what day of the week a date was, um, or recreate images that they've seen with incredible accuracy to detail. Um, and some of these special talents might arise from particular cognitive profiles, which are sometimes associated with um, autism. Um, for example, um, strengths on tasks which require visual processing and a detailed focused approach, for example. And research does suggest um, that about a third of autistic people may have a particular special skill. Um, but for the most part, autistic people have strengths and difficulties much like anyone else. Um, so again, going back to the point about fostering imaginative and creative skills, it's about helping people identify their strengths um, and equally importantly, finding things that they enjoy. Um, so some special skills can lead to successful careers um, and it's encouraging to hear about many firms offering neurodiversity recruitment initiatives, for example, as well as adjustments within the work workplace. So the civil service, for example, has um, a system called workplace adjustment passports. Um, so um, again, we're moving forward, I hope, in, in busting that myth. So over to Mariana. Great. Myth number seven is, um, it's kind of myth that we understand now autism better. So it's true to say that our understanding of neurodiversity in autism spectrum has evolved significantly over the years, and our diagnostic criteria are also more clearly defined, which has led to improved recognition. However, in truth, it's fair to say that autism spectrum defies any stereotyping or generalization of any kind. And in fact, we are seeing great heterogeneity on the autism spectrum. Whilst there are commonalities among people with autism that form defining diagnostic criteria, the way each feature presents um, varies significantly. So if you consider any feature, which is to be, which is one of the main diagnostic features for autism spectrum, um, such as, for example, sensory differences, yeah. Uh, oops, oh, thank you. Thank oh, you. Really? <laughs> Got <me> back. <laughs> no, great, great. So if you consider actually any uh, feature that's kind of define any defining diagnostic criteria, uh, we, we see huge heterogeneity in how it presents. So for example, let's take sensory differences. We know that some people with autism spectrum might be experiencing such significant uh, sensory hypersensitivity that even seams on a clothing or clothes labels can be a source of significant distress, whilst other people might be experiencing such significant sensory hyposensitivity, especially in response to kind of the internal stimuli that they perhaps might neglect, uh, let's say basic kind of um, needs, for example, uh, response to hunger or thirst, et cetera. Similarly, if you consider qualitative differences in social interaction, we can meet people on the autism spectrum who generally have preference for solitary activities to people who are hugely socially motivated. And the same can be said about every diagnostic feature associated with autism spectrum. For example, qualitative differences in communication some people with autism spectrum develop the most rich vocabulary I have ever come across. And in fact, uh, English not being my mother tongue, I'm very grateful 
for really unique learning opportunity to learn uh, very special and rare words for, uh, from children with autism spectrum I work with. Uh, whilst other people do not find verbal communication satisfying or may not use verbal communication at all and may prefer to communicate via pictures or other behaviours. So one of the biggest myths about autism is that we now understand autism because autism spectrum, as we said, defies generalization or stereotyping of any kind. And we are seeing greater heterogeneity on the autism spectrum than in a general population. As Dr. Stephen Shore, who is an autism advocate and a member of autistic community once famously said, if you've met one person with autism, you have met one person with autism. And this is very important for us to be aware of, because even if we make an effort to educate ourselves about autism, as many professionals or teachers make genuinely attempt to do nowadays, the same strategies where they're highly effective for some children on a spectrum may not be helpful for others at all. As a result, what we ought to be working towards is openness to learning from our neurodivergent community through continuous dialogue and uh, consultation, as well as encouraging self-advocacy in our children and people with autism since young age in order to make sure that we create much more inclusive environments um, than we have currently. And this kind of leads to our uh, last um, closing point or a myth, and that is that severity of autism or the amount of support impacts on outcomes in adulthood. So um, one of the first question, um, questions that majority of the parents ask after diagnostic assessment of their child is, how severe is my child's autism? And second question that very often follows is what therapies and supports should parents put in place to help children overcome their difficulties? Whilst both of these questions can be understandable and whilst in the past severity of autism was indeed considered to be a predictor of uh, outcomes in adulthood, studies over the past decade did not confirm this at all and research does not seem to indicate that severity of autism is a good predictor of outcomes in adulthood. Um, by outcomes in adulthood, we mean uh, things that impact on the quality of life, like for example, access to leisure activities, friendships, independent living, uh, marital status, self utilization employment, etc. And actually, other, um, um, in other issues, uh, for example, daily living skills or adaptive functioning or having functional communication, as well as sound mental health, being actually just as important, if not more important predictors of adult outcomes, um, especially when we are thinking about all these measures of quality of life, as we mentioned. So there is now really no doubt that people with autism or neurodiversity in general contributed significantly to all walks of life, from science to arts and technology. And we would therefore like to conclude with a very clear message um, that autism should never be in a way of people achieving well in life. And um, in fact, there's increasing number of parents who self-refer uh, for assessment after their children have been diagnosed, who are wonderful role models for their children and in general, um, in terms of being neurodivergent and having fulfilling careers and personal lives. And clinically, have been fortunate to work with people with neurodiversity for over 20 years, we have seen children with diagnosis to flourish in so many ways. Actually, we are really delighted to see that increasingly um, many young people with neurodiversity are now deciding to study psychology at university, as we would very much like to encourage um, neurodiversity in a profession as well. But indeed, there are now increasing voices from the autistic community, clearly demonstrating the amount of talent and ambitious, in, ambition in, in uh, neurodivergent communities. However, unfortunately, research does still indicate that people with neurodiversity are at increased risk of developing mental health problems and of underachieving both academically and in terms of employment. So whilst it is helpful and important to focus on therapeutic support, in our closing remark, we would like to emphasize our responsibility as um, the parent parents or professionals or colleagues, friends or members of community to make our society much more open to neurodiversity 
in order to enable people with neurodiversity to thrive and achieve to their potential. So that's, uh, that was kind of our uh, uh, prepared uh, thoughts on a commonly, um, I don't know, asked about myths on autism spectrum. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. I'm just going to launch um, a, uh, a poll now that people can uh, choose to uh, fill in if they want um, about the talk. Um, so, Anna Mariana, we had something about uh, a question around different presentations in girls. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Uh, yes, do you want to start, Marianne, or shall I? I don't mind. Yes, I mean, I'm very happy to either way. We actually have, uh, as you know, separate webinar, webinar on presentation in girls. And indeed, um, there, there's a myth about girls as well. So um, for, for once, uh, it was autism was uh, assumed to be a lot less prevalent amongst uh, girls and females uh, in general. However, we now know that actually this can be very much accounted for by our tools that we have for diagnosis, perhaps not picking up on a female presentations um, as well as on a male presentations. And we know that female presentation of autism spectrum was actually very often attributed to, um, for example, or was not even picked up until many girls uh, started presenting with co-occurring mental health problems, such as anxiety, depression, or externalizing problems. Um, and, and another myth, since actually the, the awareness of uh, female presentation with autism spectrum um, has been um, kind of become much more in the forefront of uh, public awareness has been about girls and masking. And whilst it is absolutely true, you know, masking is a significant, masking camouflaging is a significant issue in this population. Actually, research is showing us that actually we see um, same masking camouflaging amongst boys and um, males kind of in, in with autism spectrum as well. But what, what we are learning is that for, for some reason, it seems to have slightly less of an impact. A few studies are showing there's not really conclusive uh, findings in that in terms of the impact on mental health that it has for females and males. Did you want to add anything, Anne? I think that's very comprehensive. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. Just to let everyone know that the session is being recorded. Um, it'll be up online tomorrow and we'll also be sharing the slides there. So we've had a couple of questions around uh, anxiety and what appears to be severe anxiety with um, people not wanting to uh, attend school or leave their bedrooms and um, coming out in, in kind of rashes and hives. Is there anything, uh, any strategies that you could recommend for um, uh, for, for this at all? Um, I think so. One of the keys is recognising um, as early as possible, um, first of all, diagnosis, um, and then secondly, what can be done about the environment to prevent anxiety getting to the point where somebody is really struggling um, to attend school at all. Um, because then they're not going to be able to reach their potential. There's all sorts of um, opportunities which aren't going to be available to them. So it's, it's really about understanding as early as possible and then management via the environment. Um, and as I say, sometimes small things, what might appear to be a small thing anyway, can make a massive difference and can be the difference between someone attending school or not attending school. Um, so for some young people that I've worked with, it's literally dropping one subject. Uh, maybe it's a particular subject that they just didn't get on with. And then at least they had the break in the day. Um, sometimes it's about having a relationship with trusted people. Sometimes it's about having space or downtime. Um, sometimes it's um, about the support that's brought within the EH EHCP, Educational Healthcare Plan. Um, and sometimes it's about changing the environment altogether. Um, so that's thinking about it with young people. Um, obviously, the more that education and health can collaborate and work together, the better. Um, so, um, you know, this is one of my particular favourite topics. I think most people know that about me, which is the um, impact of education on mental health. Um, so rather than treating necessarily mental health, um, sometimes it's actually, uh, you know, I won't even start to treat the mental health problems until the environment's sorted out. Um, so, yeah. 
Brilliant. Um, there's quite a few questions around comorbidity where um, other mental health issues might have an impact. Um, is this more prevalent? So, for example, we have people asking about um, uh, ADHD and also OCD. Um, ADHD, certainly. Um, and this is where the neurodiversity concept comes in, becomes very useful. So rather than thinking about people who have either autism or ADHD or both autism and ADHD, um, you can, of course, have both conditions. But we like to we often talk about the Venn diagram when we produce um, when we're um, sort of presenting our formulations to clients, which is thinking about how the conditions overlap. Um, and then kind of sometimes um, unpicking like what's the driver here. Um, so, for example, if the presenting feature might be inattention, then one, we'd be wanting to think about, well, is that because of autism? Because maybe somebody's focused on their own thoughts or it's difficult for them to disengage with their own thoughts? Or is it because of a fundamental difficulty with concentrating um, and um, 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 fundamental sort of attentional, intrinsic attentional skills? That's one example. Um, OCD, certainly, again, there's an overlap there with the sort of repetitive what's called the sort of repetitive restrictive behaviours kind of domain as it were um, um, but again there's that sort of um, uh, overlap between repetitive behaviours and repetitive thinking I suppose that one might see in OCD as well um, and then of course anxiety is a very very common um, co-occurring condition um, and sort of 40 to 50 percent of people will have um, clinically significant anxiety levels so not just a bit of anxiety but clinically significant at some point in their lives. And as we know more about depression as well, um, so depression is much more prevalent. Um, again, possibly sort of around 40 to 50% of people will experience um, features of depression. I hope Thank that you very much. Um, We've got a question here uh, around meltdowns. So if you could briefly explain what a meltdown is and also if there are any uh, specific strategies to uh, alleviate this. Great. So um, again, actually, it might be helpful to put um, a link to the webinar because we have done in the past one um, webinar fully dedicated to meltdowns. And I think the really the key <coughs> in, in understanding meltdowns is actually uh, trying to differentiate and understand that actually behavior is a form of communication. So if you kind of underlining premise, if you take the behavior as a sort of communication, and what is the child trying to communicate? So the key factor is really trying to differentiate perhaps what might be the difference between a tantrum, where the child might actually want to have some particular, for example, tangible outcome from their behavior to meltdown, which actually can be um, kind of as a result of a total sensory overwhelm, for example, or a kind of multi-system kind of shutdown. And, and really trying to understand the difference between different forms of communication, difference between tantrums and meltdowns, and most importantly, trying to understand what the triggers are that can increase the risk, risk or likelihood or lead to meltdowns. So when we are thinking about meltdowns, we are always thinking kind of prevention being number one really uh, strategy. We're really trying to avoid and prevent meltdowns as much as possible and reduce any triggers that could lead to meltdowns. Uh, secondly, it's kind of learning the signs when perhaps child might be becoming um, kind of reaching the kind of increased, um, you know, sense of overwhelm. So perhaps trying to withdraw the child from the environments that are causing that uh, kind of whilst the meltdown can still be prevented. And then um, lastly, kind of when the meltdown is happening, what it is that works the best for the child in terms of actually just calming all of the senses, providing calming, safe environment, reducing the stimulation, including our own stimulation of perhaps panic, distress, etc., reducing our nonverbals, kind of providing much more soothing and peaceful environment, ensuring child safety. And then maybe once when a child is much calmer and ready and able to talk, is thinking collaboratively with a child about what kind of triggered that and how can that be prevented in the future. But we have much more details in our webinar. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Resources and links as well. Excellent. Um, is there evidence to show that neurodiverse people are drawn to each other in any way? 
Um, well, there was that paper that I mentioned, I literally just saw it today, um, which suggested that, it, you know, yes, there's a lot of benefit that can be derived from within the autistic community, um, from forming connections with each other. So yes, indeed. And what I would strongly actually say that what people with autism very, very often recommend that one of the most important factor for both their emotional well-being and for kind of succeed, whether they're kind of in employment or anywhere else, was actually finding their own tribe, which was actually frequently reflected um, or referred to as. But it was not that the tribe was not necessarily always um, reflecting neurodiverse community. It could have, but also kind of shared interests. So shared interests are also one of the main common um, driving factors as well as um, mutual understanding. Excellent. We've got a question here. Um, to what extent is eye gazing in pre-verbal development affecting a child with, auto, uh, with communication development? Uh, sorry, Matt, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Would you mind repeating it? So, yeah, in relation to communication and child development, to what extent is eye gazing uh, a pre-verbal development of this? Uh, pre-verbal you mean in terms of developing communication yes oh absolutely yes great thank you so much so I mean there's there's been huge huge amount of uh, studies done on on eye contact and differences in eye contact in social communication but of course eye contact is we can see from the earliest development you know where eye contact is one of the first kind of um communicative forum between um, infant and parent. I could see from the introductions that we actually have some people for whom um, infant observation is a subject of their study or profession who are present here today who will be able to answer it much more adequately. But of course, uh, eye contact underpins really many things, as you can see from earliest age, is kind of mimicking the facial expressions, developing, for example, you know, checking in with adult what is safe, Shared, uh, shared attention has been quite, or joint attention, there's been quite a lot of research even on the impact of um, kind of uh, joint attention uh, on not just development of pre-verbal communication, but actually even verbal communication, you know? So for example, you might be holding a phone in your hand and you would be looking at a teddy bear on a table and you would say to the child, yes, that's right, darling, that's a teddy but the child is seeing you to hold a phone. So how do they know what is a teddy? Is this a, so, so actually under, uh, eye contact does underpin a lot of crucial rudimentary building blocks um, for development of both verbal and nonverbal forms of communication. So we've got a question here about PDA. So I think first if we could just explain what PDA is um, and um, does it have to present at school and home? Um, so PDA stands for pathological demand avoidance, which has proved quite a controversial term. Um, people use different terms as well, extreme demand avoidance or demand avoidance presentations. Um, and it kind of refers to um, uh, the avoidance of demands, but not just because people can't cope or they don't have the skills or they find them aversive. Um, but fundamentally, there's something about <clears throat> a lack of control and anxiety around uh, conforming to expectations and demands. Um, so it can be very challenging to manage um, and, and one of the reasons, so it's kind of considered to be part of the autism profile, but one of the reasons that people do advocate for having a separate um, concept for PDA or whatever you want to call it, is that the traditional techniques for managing um, autistic type of behaviours or meltdowns might not be effective, um, so they're quite a different set of strategies. Um, uh, was there a second part to that question? Sorry. Uh, about uh, school attendance, basically. Uh, oh, and it was about whether it has to be across both settings. Yes. I mean, it's not a diagnostic category as such. So there aren't formal criteria. Um, certainly our, in our experience, no. Um, actually, some people can present wonderfully at school. Um, and um, But the challenges are at home um, in terms of uh, the demand avoidance. Um, and this can be to do again with anxiety about not wanting to stand out, about um, breaking rules, getting into trouble, etc. Um, but that can result in that the, the pressure of conforming um, and um, adhering to demands at school can be so enormous that children then come out of school and, and, and have emotional challenges at home. Excellent. We have a question here relating to uh, selective mutism. Could you... Uh... First of all, kind of briefly explain that, if there are any strategies to, to, to help with that and whether uh, it affects a particular age group at all. 
So it's so like to meet them, although like, like with uh, quite few other co-occurring conditions, um, they can be two separate conditions. So selective mutism can be associated with autism spectrum and, and um, it doesn't necessarily need to be associated with, uh, with autism spectrum. So perhaps really kind of good understanding of, um, of, of kind of what, what is underpinning um, the development of the condition is it selective mutism or is it actually autism? Is it based on a basis of um, neurodiversity? Um, and then really there's, there's there are very clear evidence-based protocols um, and kind of strategies to really encourage the child's um, kind of reduced anxiety, increased kind of uh, um, social fo focus on social interactions, reducing the importance of language and actually making the social interaction um, enjoyable for the child increasing the child's kind of desire to engage in social situations re with, with reduced pressure and even reduced pressure on language. So perhaps kind of thinking about the anxiety triggers and, and general social pressures on a child in general in various environments. That's brilliant. So we've got time for one last um, question uh, and um, it's probably the toughest really. <laughs> so when parents are waiting for a diagnosis for their children, what should they do? What, what can be done? Yes, it is very, I mean, it is very, very tough. And it is actually particularly tough um, when kind of now post pandemic, because, you know, before we considered that to be a major problem that uh, many trusts had, let's say one year waiting list, but this actually has now been increased to really two or even three years in some of the trusts. So you know, for in child development, this is an incredible amount of time. And, um, and I suppose, you know, what we try and what we always try and um, kind of focus on is, is utility of a clinical diagnosis. Yes. Yeah? So whilst obviously having diagnosis is important in order to inform support and, and services and in, for many young people also in terms of their identity, but actually a lot of strategies that we recommend, especially, for example, in education or in terms of um, adaptations, for example, psychological therapies, etc. Actually, many of those are just kind of good practice guidelines that many other children can benefit from. So actually, if you're thinking about adapting environments at school, many of the strategies we would be recommending would be just as useful for children, for example, with more severe anxiety, um, ADHD, language difficulties, you know, things like, for example, visual resources, room for timeout, uh, opportunity for kind of one-to-one -one support when needed etc so it's always thinking whilst people are waiting can actually this child can we maybe just have open kind of working hypotheses that a child would need a support and can we adapt more child-centered approach rather than necessarily diagnosis kind of driven approach that would perhaps be um you know our recommended way forward is kind of thinking about child-centered approach Find out more about becoming an ACAM member and to be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health. Visit www.acamh.org.